So it's my pleasure to be here this morning uh, to be a humble servant to the Lord. And I just want to set my stopwatch so that I don't keep you too long today, because that would not be good. So, um, anyway, so last week uh, we were in our second part of our sermon series, Evaluate, Equip, and Execute. And as you know, this sermon series is not just walking through the book of Nehemiah, but it's also, as a church, our strategy to revitalize our body. Now, sometimes when we talk about church revitalization, uh, some folks might have a negative feeling about that word. What, well, what does that mean, Pastor? Does that mean our church isn't good? Does it mean it's failed? No, it doesn't mean that. As a matter of fact, every church, whether they're 5,000 strong or five people strong, needs to be revitalized. You know, our life as Christians is a daily practice of repentance and faith. Even though we're saved, we still sin. We live in this sinful body and we make mistakes every day. And our job as Christians is to grow each and every moment into the image of the perfect person of Jesus Christ. And so revitalization, that word is not a bad word. It's not a scary word. It's a necessary word. The church that I attended before this one, you would consider it healthy and it, and it has 120 members. But even they are seeking revitalization. Our job is to never stop seeking the face of God. And so this morning, we're in the third part. This morning's sermon is titled, The God of Heavens Will Grant Us Success. I can't think of a better way to describe how any church would be successful in the mission that God has put them on. This morning, I'm going to start in verse 11 in the book of Nehemiah. If you have your Bibles and um, you're getting there, we're going to start in verse 11 in chapter 2, and we're going to end at verse 20. And I'm going to begin. It says, After I, Nehemiah, arrived in Jerusalem and had been there for three days, I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the one I was riding. I went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but farther down it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up at night by the way of the valley and inspected the wall. Then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. Now the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So I said to them, you see the trouble that we're in? Jerusalem is lying in ruins, and its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall, so that we will no longer be a disgrace. I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me, and what the king had said to me. They said, let's start rebuilding, and their hands were strengthened to do this good work. But when Sanballat the Hornite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and despised us and said, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I gave them this reply. The God of heavens is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding, but you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. What a powerful and climactic part of this book that we're in today. So far, it's been a slow burn. We learn of a report that Nehemiah receives in Jerusalem, I'm sorry, excuse me, in Susa, the capital city of Persia, 900 miles away from Jerusalem. He hears about the condition of God's city. He's torn to the heart. He's in despair. He prays and fasts for four months, seeking the God of heaven to give him an opportunity to rebuild the city. In a sovereign and, and perfect way, God aligns Circumstances that one day when Nehemiah is around, the king of the largest empire in the world, Artaxerxes I, he's able to ask this request of the king, let me go rebuild my city. And the king, who would have had every right to execute him for asking something like that, said, when will you be back? We'll miss you. Really, that's kind of what he said, right? And Nehemiah was, was shocked, but he doesn't stop there. He asks for everything that he needs to be successful. And he travels to Jerusalem. And as he's traveling, he doesn't just go alone or with his Jewish compatriots. 
He's actually blessed beyond what he's asked. And Artaxerxes gives him a royal escort of officers and military men for a safe journey to Jerusalem. But word of their travels goes ahead of them. And we hear in the cliffhanger last week, right, like at the end of maybe one of your favorite movies where everything seems happy, but at the end that enemy suddenly comes back to life and you're like, uh-oh, it's another sequel. It's going to be whatever movie, seven, right? Got to make money, Hollywood, right? But in the Bible, what a, what a much better storyline. The cliffhanger is this, that these Persian governors, these officials that were put in charge of kind of ruling over and, and administering these territories of the empire, they don't like the fact that Nehemiah is coming. Twelve years before, they had shut down the work on the temple and the wall with Ezra the scribe and the first group of uh, Jews that had returned from exile. And it, were the, it was these officials that sent letters to the king and shut it down. And so now we arrive today in this next portion and we see that Nehemiah arrives in the city. And the first thing he does is he rests for three days. Now this is important. And as we go into this, let me just give you this, um, this filter to look at everything through. Remember that this is not prescriptive. We're not looking at this book and saying that everything Nehemiah did, our church has to do, and it's a one-to-one. -one. That's That would be wrong interpretation and application of God's word. This is a historical narrative. It's a history of what actually happened. What we are going to do, however, is we're going to look at what happens and we're going to take that principle, these principles, and we're going to try to use them for our church today and hopefully for our success in our mission. So why do I say that? Well, we need to focus here real quick, or maybe not so quick, on this idea of rest. Why would this even be there? Well, first of all, we have to understand that Nehemiah is not just doing things willy-nilly, right? He's not just kind of like, what am I going to do today? Maybe I'll travel a few miles. Oh, I'm in Jerusalem. Let me just see the sights and drink some orange juice and, and hang out. No, he's resting for a strategic purpose. Nehemiah knows the work that has to begin. He knows how hard it's going to be. He has an idea of the opposition that they're going to face. And so this rest is strategic. What we have to understand is that rest is not a luxury. It can be extra rest. But rest is something that God has given us as a blessing and as a need. And as Christians, we cannot overlook the importance of rest. First, we need to know that rest is commanded by God. We know that in the law of Moses, God commands the Israelites to rest on the Sabbath, to model what God had done. God has wired in us the necessity to rest. You can try to stay awake as long as you want to, but eventually you might hallucinate and pass out, right? Like that will happen uh, for young people in the room on your marathon gaming sessions. I'm sure you've almost gotten there. There's not enough monster energy drinks in the world to get you through, right? You have to stop eventually and rest. And listen, this is what's so important. This idea of Sabbath rest and this idea of God creating our bodies to have downtime the real purpose of that is not so we can feel that awesome feeling of sleeping and... I, know, I love that, sorry. No, it's not for that, right? It's, it's to point us to God. What, what do you mean, uh, Chuck? What, what do you mean point us to God? Well, listen, on the seventh day, God rested from creation, right? That's what it says. That doesn't mean that he was tired or that God somehow, you know, used up all his God muscle and he has to recover and drink some protein shakes. What it means is... God stopped to rest in what he had done, to enjoy it, right? God had created the perfect creation, and he took time to stop activity and just marvel at it. Well, what about us? Well, that rest for Nehemiah here and for us on Sundays when we hopefully observe the Sabbath um, is so that we not only get rest to recharge our batteries, but also so that we can rest in the love of God, right? That's important. If we're going through the rest of the week on mission for the Lord, and we don't take time to rest in His presence and stop all of our human activity, we're going to burn out. And when we burn out, we're not going to be able to effectively perform the job that God has in store for us. 
So Nehemiah is showing us this. Now, we're talking about individuals right now, right? Like you and me in our personal lives. But, but you've got to hear this. It's about a church as a whole. Our church has to be ready to do the hard work ahead. Nehemiah had to be ready to do the hard work ahead. He needed to physically be prepared. He needed to mentally be prepared and spiritually be prepared. Now, the scripture doesn't tell us what he did during those three days, but everything that we know about Nehemiah points to the idea that he was praying, that he was meditating on God's word, and he was spiritually getting ready to do this tough job. As a group of Christians today, as members of this church, we need to be good stewards of our physical resources that God has given us. Our health, our ability to be awake and to do things, whatever that capacity is, that's not because you're lucky or you ate really good throughout your life. It's a gift from God. The very air that you breathe, you take it in and you let it out. God is giving that to you. And we need to be good stewards of that. Revitalization is hard. Nehemiah is about to revitalize the city of God. Right? We're about to revitalize Harvest House Community Fellowship for God's glory. We need to be physically and spiritually energized. If our gas tank is empty, we're not going to go too far. It's like buying a Lamborghini. Or for me, I would like a giant diesel truck and all the money to put the gas in. Right? That would be my dream car. And speaking of gas, you get it in the driveway and you're like, man, I'm ready. But you don't have any gas in it. You're not going to go anywhere, right? That's common sense. So we've got to fill up that gas tank. And we do that not by sitting around, sleeping, although sleep is important. We don't do it by watching our favorite TV shows, right? We do it by abiding in the presence of Jesus, being in prayer, being in fellowship with other believers, eating from the Word of God, right? That's the manna that Jesus is giving us. It's His Word. It's our sustenance. That's how we need to rest and prepare for this work of revitalization. And listen, you have to hear this, church. You can't minister to other people, which is what revitalization is, right? It's reaching other people with and for the gospel. We can't minister to other people if we need ministering to. Right? If we're in such spiritual fatigue, and if we're in a state of mind uh, or, or being where we are so broken down and tired and worn out, we can't be productive because we need somebody to come along and hold our arms up for us, right? And Nehemiah knows this, and that's why he's resting, and that's why we need to take this principle. Our church right now is entering a time of rest for the strategic purpose of evaluation. They go hand in hand. We can't evaluate what is going on with anything while we're in motion in an activity, can we? I want to tell you a quick funny story. I hope you think it's funny. It's kind of crazy and it shows how irresponsible I am, right? So we came up here, we, as some of you know, we lived in Texas for 15 years. And over our spring break, which I think was the second week of March, we flew up to spend a week here and to, and to worship with you all for two Sundays. And what our practice was when we when we come up those few times is we would fly into Philadelphia. Uh, Jeanette's parents and my parents, they lived there. And so we would fly in there, spend the night, rent a car, and then we would drive up the next day. Well, we wanted to really make a good impression. And we wanted to really uh, do a great job of worship. So we had scheduled to get some sound equipment for my uncle. But what we didn't count on is that we didn't have enough room in this rental vehicle. So we strapped our, we put all the expensive sound equipment in the back of this SUV. And then the, the roof of this rental car didn't have a luggage rack. And we didn't have any straps. I had a few bungee cords and a couple pieces of string. And we literally took our luggage, put it on this bare roof, and kind of, you know, tied it up. Well, now we're coming up the northeast extension doing 75, 80 miles an hour. And there's a sunroof. And we can hear the luggage on top of the roof going, <laughs> as the wind is hitting it. And I'm just, I mean, it's flurrying, right? It's like snowing a little bit. And so I, and my wife, God bless her, I said, Jeanette. I'm going to open the sunroof. I want you to stand up, <laughs> peek your head out, and see if that luggage is secure. So I'm flying down the road. This is a true story, isn't it? Well, you weren't there, but you were there, you know. And poor Jeanette, her legs are there. I'm holding on to her leg, right? And she's like, I can't see. So, what, so all joking aside, what was I asking her to do 
you of asking her to evaluate the condition of our really thought out plan of luggage transportation, right? We couldn't really do it when we were moving. Flying down 75 miles an hour on the road, there was no way she was really going to be able to evaluate it and say, 10-4, big, big daddy, we got it. She can't know that. So eventually I had to do what I didn't want to do, and I pulled over on the side of the road. I got out, I went up, I was able to see what was going on, and then we did secure it down. And thank God, because we needed his grace and mercy for this one. We made it without losing a single thing or having the luggage crash into the car behind us, which is my big fear, right? Um, so hopefully that illustration shows you we need to evaluate. Right now, we have a strategic purpose of looking at everything that we're doing in this church. Why? Because if we're going to be on mission for God, we need to know, number one, what that mission is. We need to know what resources God has given us to do that. And then we need to make a plan to do it. Okay, that's important. So right now, if you haven't already realized, we're taking this time to rest from non-essential activity. We're focusing on our worship service. This is the most important thing we do as a church. It's like a pep rally for the week, right? We're gathering around the name of Jesus. We're lifting it high. We're feeding on his word. And then we're going out into the community and proclaiming his name. Uh, an author of the commentary, one of the commentaries that I used to study for today, uh, his name is T.J. Betts. I quoted him last week. He has a great line that I'd like to share with you. This is a quote from his commentary on Nehemiah. He says, some believers today confuse activity with spirituality, but the two are not necessarily the same. When one gives proper deliberation concerning the Lord's work, one will recognize the importance of strategic relaxation to carry it out. That's what we're doing right now. So what should we be doing? We're resting, right? Well, how does that get us ready? Well, first of all, we can build relationships with one another. Nehemiah wasn't just there for three days twiddling his thumbs. I guarantee you he was meeting with people. He was talking. He was, he was introducing himself. He didn't know the people there. So he was, he was making relationships already on those three days. He was trying to get the lay of the land, to understand the people he was working with. So we need to gather around one another. We just had a great Wednesday night where we ate some hamburgers and did a silly game of bingo and won some fun prizes, right? I got spray painted in my hair and all sorts of crazy stuff. And as silly as that seemed, that was important because we were building relationships. We were resting in Jesus' love with each other, resting spiritually so that when the fall comes in the winter and we come to Wednesday night discipleship and we gather around God's word, we have energy in our tanks to do that. We also need to grow in our dependency for Jesus. We have to learn that it's not our strength in anything we do in life, whether it's revitalizing our church or going to our 9 to 5 job or making the world the most amazing dessert. Sorry, I can't stop saying it. Those sticky buns were amazing, Susan. I love you, sister. Buy some sticky buns, just saying. No matter what we're doing, no matter what we're doing, we have to depend on the Lord's strength. If we don't, we will fail. There is no two ways about it. It's black and white. Without Jesus, we will not succeed. And listen, we also need to heal our personal and spiritual lives. You and I both know that if we're honest and we look in that spiritual mirror, that we are doing things that we don't want to do every day. Romans chapter 7, right? Paul says, I keep doing the things that I don't want to do. And I'm, you know, it's like this who's on first, who's on second thing. And basically what he's saying is, I'm trying not to sin, but I keep sinning. And why do we need to know that? Because the grace of Jesus is, is sufficient for that. So we need to heal our relationship with Jesus. Maybe we haven't been in prayer enough, or our devotion time hasn't been satisfactory. Maybe we haven't even been going to the scripture because we're afraid, because we know when we look at it, it's going to show us where we're falling short. Maybe we've committed some sin and we're shameful. Well, well I'm here to tell you, so what? God already forgave you, right? Jesus already forgave you for those sins. When you turned to Christ in faith and you were saved and in a twinkling of an eye you were a new creation, he didn't just forgive you for what you've done to that point. He knows your whole life. He knows eternity before eternity was even a thing. And he forgave you for every bit of it. You are never too dirty. You are never too filthy. You are never too atrocious back to the feet of our Savior Jesus. 
He knows you better than you do. That doesn't give you excuse to do those things. But when we sin and we know we're wrong, don't stay away. Run back to the Savior. Come to His feet. Ask Him to renew you. And He promises that He will not ever forsake you. If you're faithful to confess your sins, God will be faithful to forgive you. We can do that when we're resting, can't we? We can think about those things that we need to change in our lives. Like Nehemiah, we need to take time to rest in the arms and the care of the Lord. Not to be idle spiritually, but rather to build our devotion and adoration of Jesus. We need to build spiritual equity, right? Like in our homes when we pay our mortgages, right? We get that equity build up so that we can spend it during the hard and long season of missional living we're about to enter. We need to build up some spiritual equity. So after three days of rest, Nehemiah got up at night. He takes a few men with him. He doesn't tell anybody what he's going to do. God had already laid a plan on his heart in, in terms of rebuilding Jerusalem. He just takes one animal. He doesn't want to give, give it up, right? He doesn't want to draw attention. And he takes some of his helpers with him, and he goes riding to inspect the wall. Now, what Nehemiah is demonstrating here is wisdom. Wisdom is doing the right thing at the right time in the right way for the right reason. And that reason is always Jesus. God gave him the plan to execute, but Nehemiah needs to see exactly the condition of things. That's important. He needs to know exactly what has to be done. And he does it secretly and alone. And there's some practical reasons why he's doing this. First of all, this Jewish people that he's come to, even though they're his people and they're the people of God, we know that there are some inside threats going on. There are some people there that are kind of like spilling the beans about what's going on. They've already kind of come up against that. They know that Tobiah and Sanballat are out to get them. So he doesn't want to give the opposition any head start in, in you know, stopping the work. He wants to get ahead of the opposition. What are you, when you are... Sorry, I'm talking fast. Let me slow down for a second. When you're starting uh, a project or you're in an organization and a problem comes up, do you want to react all the time to those problems? Or do you want to be proactive so that they don't happen? Right? I like to be proactive, although sometimes I, I'm reactive because I'm a procrastinator and certain things. But I think if we all had to choose, we would rather be proactive. Like I get an oil change in my car so that it doesn't seize up on the turnpike coming home from my fiancé's college. I mean, that never happened to me, right? It did. So be proactive. That's what Nehemiah is doing. He's getting ahead of the opposition. Why should he let everybody know what he's doing when they're only going to be against him anyway? And listen, Jesus tells the disciples to be the same way when he sent out the twelve to the different cities. Do you remember this in the Gospel? In Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 to 17, Jesus is speaking. He says, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Beware of them, because they will hand you over to local courts and flog you in their synagogues. Jesus, number one, is talking about Jews here. And that's what the disciples were, and that's who Jesus was. Nehemiah is dealing with Jewish people. The message here is this. When you do the mission of God... People aren't going to like you. And they're going to come after you. We're the sheep. We're the sheep in the pasture of the Lord. And he's our shepherd. And he is telling us here in Matthew, I will protect you, but that doesn't give you an excuse not to do things in a wise way, right? Nehemiah is embodying that. He doesn't tell anybody. So he went out at night and then describes where he went. He went through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate. He inspected the walls of Jerusalem. They'd all been broken down. Of course, the gates had been destroyed by fire. For the first time in his life, he puts eyes on it. He's only heard about it. Now he sees it. He knows what it really is. Then he went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool. He went farther down, but it was too narrow. Because 150 years ago, the walls were destroyed and the rubble was all across the path. So he gets off of his horse and he walks. And he went up by night by the way of the valley and inspected the wall by foot. Then he headed back and entered through the valley gate where he started and returned. Now, that can seem like, I, I like to call this in scripture flyover verses, right? It's like lists of names and genealogies, you know? 
so and so we got so and so we got so and so and what I mean by flyover is it's like okay I better read this because it's God's word and I know it's all important but I'm going to read this really quick because what I really want to get to is the meat I'm like that too but there's a lesson in these verses the lesson is if you were to look at an ancient map of Jerusalem he went counterclockwise and he inspected every square inch of that wall he didn't leave one bit out it was a total evaluation he didn't leave one section for later. He didn't say, well, that over there looks kind of bad. I'm, I don't want to deal with that right now. We'll get to that later. He does the hard and honest thing, and he looks at the entire thing. There are no shortcuts. He ignored nothing. And listen, what was Nehemiah really doing? He was counting the cost, wasn't he? He was counting the cost. How much damage was there really? How much stone is he going to need to use to rebuild this wall that surrounds an entire city and needs to be, you know, twice as high as uh, a, human, a human man? How much wood are they going to need? And even more important, even, even more important than the materials, how much labor is he going to need? He can't do it himself. That would, I mean, he'd still be doing it today if he had to do it himself, right? How is he going to divide that labor? So if he has this many people, who's going to do what and when? So this invoice that he's going to receive, this proverbial invoice, it's going to look painful, isn't it? You know, it's like when we need a repair to our home, and we've got to get it done, or, or like we can't live there, and the contractor comes out, and he says, here's the cost for the repair. Ooh, punch in the gut. That's when I'm like, I wish I learned how to be a contractor, because I'd save a whole lot of money. But it's necessary. It has to be done. Let's come to today. What's the principle? The principle is this. We have to deal with counting the cost as well. You see, Nehemiah was about the physical cost. Jerusalem was a physical city built. God said, my name will be dwelling there. Right? My name is going to dwell there. It was a physical example and representation of God's glory. It was an image and a foreshadowing of our church today, which is in us. But for us today, church revitalization is about rebuilding a community of born-again believers in Christ. You see? So Nehemiah is building a physical city, representing the glory of God. Our job here in our revitalization is building up a people of God that displays his actual glory through the gospel. That's a big deal, church. That's a huge deal. Our walls are lost people. Our walls are unbelievers that have not yet turned to Christ in faith. The spiritually broken people that are ravaged by sin. They're dead right now and they don't even know it. That's what Ephesians 2 says. It says, you were once already dead in your trespasses and sins. And so they need to count the cost. We need to count the cost. Are we willing to do the hard work of spreading the gospel? Because that work is not just glory and fame. That work is hard. It's a grind. It's taking one step after the other. And when we're tired and we're weary and we're slumped over, it's asking the Lord to hold us up and taking another ten steps. It's about people mocking us and deriding us. It's about maybe getting a, shirt, a church shut down because we need to worship when the government says we can't. It's going into town when they're having a festival and setting up a booth and proclaiming who we are as a church and having some atheist group come up and try to shut us down. These things happen every day. We've got to be prepared. Are we willing? We need to count the cost. Here's what Jesus says about it in the Gospel of Luke. He says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will be, begin to ridicule him, saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions, and we can also insert former life, right, cannot be my disciple. As a New Testament church, 
We are church builders. We must show the lost the cost of their condition. Whether they believe in Jesus or not, there is going to be a cost. They need to hear the gospel and see their true and current relationship to God. Whether they believe in God or not, we all have a relationship with Him. Some of us, we are in His family. He loves us and will never let us go. Others are at war with God. Others are at war. I'm, I don't want to go to war with God. I'm just telling you right now I'm going to lose. And so we'll do this. They are already dead in their sins, separated from the magnificent and glorious Creator by an infinite chasm. It is at this point that they need to either repent and believe that Jesus is the Son of God and able to forgive them for their sin, or they must remain in their sin at the expense of eternity with the Savior. Do you want to lose your life here for an eternity with the Creator and Savior? Or do you want to lose eternity for a hand's breadth in this God-forsaken planet? Let's be honest. I'll trade this for eternity with God any day. We can rightly say that Nehemiah came to rebuild the physical city of Jerusalem and as a result glorifying God and his people. But Jesus came for better reasons and with a better promise. He came to rebuild each person's relationship with God. The officials didn't know where Nehemiah had gone or what he was doing. For he had not told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So Nehemiah said to them, You see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's walls so that we will no longer be a disgrace. The Israelites knew the condition of their city well enough. It wasn't a secret to them. But here's the thing. We get used to what's familiar, don't we? Three and a half weeks ago, we drove in at 5.30 a.m. to the parsonage and, and passed out from a two-day trip from Texas. The next morning, I was like, oh, those cow pastures stink. I don't even notice it anymore. You know what I'm saying? So these Jewish people, they're living in a city that's torn down and in total disrepair. They kind of started to like it. Don't we like to live in our own filth if we're honest? We get used to it, right? We all define what, what, what comfort is. That's what the Jews were, were experiencing. They needed a leader like Nehemiah to come in. They needed a guy with fresh eyes, a fresh perspective, focused on God's glory. He had no baggage in that community. He didn't have any connections. He was uniquely situated to do what needed to be done. And look, Harvest House, we need to look at ourselves. We need to evaluate ourselves. What damage is there in this church? Where is the disrepair? Where is the brokenness here? As well as where are our strong points? Where are the good parts? But I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about us, the people of the church, our spiritual lives. We need to be honest and look at that. We're the church, not the building. I think this puts it in perspective in 1 Peter 2.5. He talks about the church as being a spiritual house that's built out of living stones. Here's what he says. You yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are the church. Each one of us are a single part of the whole. In light of this truth, we need to be like Nehemiah and privately assess the needs of the church for repair. That starts with ourselves, right? We need to evaluate our own spiritual life. Where can we be better? And, and being better doesn't mean I do something, therefore God blesses me. It's God saved me. How can I love him more? How can I depend on him more? How can I run to him more? How can I repent to him more? That's number one. And second, we need to evaluate our spiritual relationship with each other. Then we can be in, begin to ask the why do we questions. Why do we? Well, why do we do what we do? Right? That's evaluation. Nehemiah issues the challenge to the Jewish people, right? He says, come, let's build Jerusalem's wall. He said, really, let's do the impossible. Why? Not for safety. I mean, yeah, okay, a little bit. But they've already been living there for a long time this way. It's about God's glory, right? 
to rebuild the wall. Why? So that they would no longer be a disgrace. They want to represent God in a way that would magnify His glory. Safety is the afterthought, right? That's the, that's the byproduct. So Nehemiah says, I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. And then they said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. So Nehemiah, what does he do? He gives them a testimony. He's telling God's people what God has done. And that's motivating. It affirms that the prayers of the people of God are being answered. It confirms that God's sovereignty is true in all circumstances. And what does that mean? He does what he said he's going to do, doesn't he? God always does what he said he's going to do. And it also builds this communal faith for total dependence on God. Then the second thing he says is he talks about what the Persian king said, which is really telling more about what God did, because it was God that turned his heart. This Artaxerxes I, who told the officials 12 years earlier to by force if they have to stop the rebuilding of Jerusalem, suddenly tells Nehemiah, go take care of it, take whatever you need. That's a miracle, folks. Humans don't do that. I don't want to be wrong. I don't like to admit it when I am. This guy is like the, the king of like the known world at the time. He's looked at almost as a god by the pagans. And he just changes his mind because God got into his heart. He gives courage for a people in a hostile land. This is, this is encouraging to them. And so what's the result? God's people get fired up. Let's get it, guys. That's what their reaction is. I'm motivated. Let's go get it. Let's build these walls. It's like the troops are rallied. It's like Braveheart, right? When Mel Gibson gets in front and he's giving that speech and we don't really know what he said, but man, he looks strong. And he's yelling and screaming and we're like, yeah, let's go! That's what the Jews are doing right now. They're like, let's do this. Let's rebuild. And listen, God's plan that he had foretold in Scripture is finally coming into focus. Nehemiah could not do this alone either. He needed people's help. Your pastor, whether it's me or Pastor Arnie, or the next one, or the one after that, we can't do it alone. We're nowhere near as awesome as Nehemiah, first of all, right? But second of all, we're one person. It's going to take all of us. We're in this together. We're all on equal footing. Nehemiah never once said, I told them to do this. He said, we did, we did this. We, we, we. Well, I'm saying we, we, we. Let's do it. Let's, let's be all in. We prayed about spiritual unity last week. Let's continue that idea. And like all good movie scenes, there's the cliffhanger for next week. Ready? Everything seems great. The Jews are ready to do it. Yes, let's go! But, boom, 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 went Sanballat, the Hornite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and a new guy, Geshem, the Arab, heard about this. They mocked and despised us and said, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? All of a sudden, opposition rears its head again, but in living color, right? It's not just a rumor. It's happening in real time and in a real place. Now, what, what's interesting is this shows that they were surrounded by enemies. Sanballat, he was the governor of what is now Samaria, north of Jerusalem. Tobiah was from Ammon, which is to the west. So, like, you think, here's the Mediterranean Sea, right? Here's the coast of Israel. So to the north here, you've got Sanballat, you've got Tobiah over here, and the Geshem is from the, the uh, Arab, the, well, it's Arabia, but they would call it Araba, and that's to the south. So these three men represent a complete surrounding of opposition. Kind of sounds like today was real, doesn't it? Kind of sad, actually. But God's people will always be threatened by darkness. So this is hard. The Jews are scared, but... Listen, they know that God's people are always hated. The people, Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem, they're trying to shame the Jews. They're trying to get them to second-guess who they are. They're trying to get the Jews to say, well, I know I'm God's people, but maybe I am not a good person. Maybe, maybe they're right. They're trying to get the Jews to take their eyes off the mission. And then they try to threaten the Jews with false accusation and misrepresentation. I mean, they already did it the first time in the book of Ezra. That's how they got them to stop. They wrote a letter to the king and said, Hey, king, this is a rebellious people. And then the king put a stop. But see, listen here. They're trying it again. 
and they think it's going to work. This opposition was an attempt to take the people's eyes off of God and the mission and the provision and then to put it on themselves and their weakness. This is the same today. We can count on it. My biggest enemy is myself and your enemy is you. We tell ourselves all the time that we're not worthy. We're not, but Christ makes us worthy. And we need to have faith in that fact. And we're going to keep on worshiping the king. So, so we have to care more about what God thinks than what mankind thinks. And that's what we're seeing here. Are we more scared about what people around us think and say about us? Or are we more worried about what God is thinking of what we're doing for him? But Nehemiah, man, he has the greatest reply. It's awesome. He says, I gave him this reply. The God of heavens is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But you have no share, no right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Drop the mic. That's awesome. Listen, he doesn't stoop to their level. He doesn't defend them, right? That's what I would probably do. Well, I'm not rebelling, right? I'm not rebelling. I'm, I'm just doing what I was told to do. No, I love the king. He doesn't do any of that. I answer to one guy, and that guy is God. No distractions. He appeals to the ultimate authority. He glorifies God, not the threat of man. And he's basically saying, mind your own business. We don't answer to you. If you don't like it, you can take it up with the true king, the one true and living God. So bold faith and godly courage are what Nehemiah used to come up against this opposition. Nehemiah demonstrates his giftedness here as a godly leader. He rightly keeps his and his people's focus on God while relying totally on God's strength, while rejecting the false accusations and hostile actions of their enemies. What an awesome example. If only I had that boldness, if I'm confronted out in the real world here right now with somebody you know, mocking me because of my faith in Jesus, I hope that I can say I answer to the God of heaven and he's going to grant my success. I pray right now for all of us that we would have that Holy Spirit given strength and boldness to declare the truth of God. So closing thoughts. And these are going to be in the form of some questions I want you to think about. What has the Holy Spirit put into your heart to do? How is your personal relationship with Christ? What has he put in your heart to do within your local church? Do you see the trouble that we're in, Harvest House? That's what Nehemiah said to the Jews. We can say it right now. Look at the trouble. There are unbelievers all around us. My wife delivered cookies to many of the homes here, and I can tell you many of them are not believers. You can go into Tuan and very quickly see how many unbelievers there are. And that's not unique to here. That's the whole world. What about spiritual brokenness caused by sin in our families, our very families? We all have family members that are struggling spiritually. How about our neighbors that we're friends with? How about believers who have fallen away and broken fellowship for lesser things? How many people sat here on Sunday morning worshiping with you week in and week out, and as COVID came and went, we don't see them anymore? Look at the trouble that we're comforted in what has always been, and that it's blinding us to what we need to be and do. And that starts with me. Are we so comfortable in what we see around us that we're unwilling to do the better thing that Jesus is calling us to? So that sounds dark and bleak, but listen, there's good news. What are the answers? Let's be willing to work together. All of us, we're in this together. Let's build relationships with one another and with unbelievers to share the gospel. Look, you don't have to be the guy on YouTube that goes out into the middle of the city, stands up on a box, right, and says, repent, or what do they say, turn or burn, right? You don't have to do that. All you got to do is get to know somebody. Start a relationship. If you're praying that God will present an opportunity to share Christ with them, he will give you that opportunity. In Nehemiah's case, it took him four months to get an opportunity to ask to go to Jerusalem. I know people right now that are living in Salt Lake City, and they're making relationships with lost people, and they've been in that relationship for two to three years, and they still haven't had an opportunity, but they're being faithful and relying on the Lord's timing. We have to pray for and tend to the spiritual needs of our families. Don't ignore your family because 
You want to be here being busy with activities at the church. Men, you are a priest to your family first and everything else second. We need to reach out to our beloved brothers and sisters that have fallen away. And it can't be just me. I don't know them. You do. We need to call and in love gently say, hey, how you doing? And if they're going to another church, encourage them. They don't need to come to this church. There's Bible-believing churches all over. But if they're not in fellowship with believers and in communion with God, that is, that is a sad state of affairs. And listen, the cost of revitalization is like following Jesus. We have to give up our personal desires, comforts, and this is the hard one, ready? Our idols. That's us, right? We, we worship ourselves. And then we have to be on mission for the glory of God. Take heart. Be encouraged. The God of the heavens will grant us success if we rely on Jesus. Jesus has given us assurance that the building of the church is his will and that he will not forsake us on this journey. Spoiler alert. Nehemiah rebuilds the wall. Nehemiah brings the Jews back to fellowship with God and restores the city. And we can do the same here. We can revitalize Harvest House. I want to read to you a few scriptures Take God's word for it. Matthew 9, 38. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. That's a command. Matthew 16, 18. And I also say that, and I, excuse me, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The rock is Jesus. And the gates of Hades, or some translations would say hell, the gates of hell will not overpower it. John 14, 12 to 14. Truly I tell you, Jesus said, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Let's ask Jesus in his name to revitalize our church. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you and remember, and this is Jesus, I am with you always to the end of the age. Can we fail, church? The answer is no. We cannot fail because if we pray the will of God, he will be faithful to answer. The will of God is to bring sinners to saints. Well, what does that mean? It means that we have, to, we have to share the good news to a lost and dying world. I'd like to invite our musicians up. And, and what that means is this, that we have to share the gospel with them. Well, what's the gospel? The gospel is not just something for sinners. It's not just something uh, that we tell people that don't know Jesus. It's something we have to preach to ourselves each and every day. The gospel is good for us, and it's good for the sinner. The gospel is this. Christ took on the punishment that we rightfully deserved. Christ did that. No amount of good work on your part can earn any favor with God. It's like filthy rags. The creator is not impressed by the actions of the creation. It just doesn't work that way. God's standard is perfection. And the moment that we break God's law in thought, deed, or action, we are separated from him for an eternity. We've committed treason against a holy God. And he is perfectly just to punish us. But God made a way where there was no way. He sent his son eternally present with the Father. He made him into one of us, a physical person. He became the very creation that he made. And he lived a life that we couldn't. He lived a perfect life. He was tempted like us. He suffered hunger and pain and all of those things like us. And yet he never failed. He always did what was right. He fulfilled everything that the Father wrote about him in the scriptures. And then he allowed himself to be put on a Roman cross and physically destroyed for our sins. But while he was suffering physically, the Father poured out the wrath of all the sinners that we rightly deserve to take. That's a double hit, isn't it? It's one thing to suffer physically, but the wrath of God poured out on us? Oh my goodness, may it never be. He died a real death, the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice. And on the third day, he rose again, proving that he was who he said he was, showing that he was God. And after 40 days, he ascended into heaven. Why is that important? Because it says no unclean thing can enter heaven. So if Jesus, as a physical man, entered heaven, it showed that he was perfect. He was clean. And he had to be that way so that his sacrifice would count on our behalf. 
He gave us all his righteousness and took all our sinfulness. That's the gospel. And each and every day we need to preach that to ourselves because we still think we, we're going to try to like white knuckle grip it, aren't we? Well, this week I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to pray more and I'm going to, God's going to love me more. No, God already loved you because of what Jesus did. That's the gospel. So what I would like you to do now is I want you to, oh my goodness, we have no electricity. And that's okay because wait till you see the song we're going to sing. This is so good. God is awesome. All right. So wait, I'm getting excited. <laughs> Here's a, look, here's our time of response. I love you guys. When we hear God's word and we hear it taught, it has power. And we're not called in scripture to just hear it and go about our business. We're called to respond, right? There, has to, there is a reaction. All right? And what the apostles would do when they would meet in their homes in Acts of the Apostles is they would leave singing a song, right? Maybe some of you uh, need to pray during this time. You need to really pray about what you've heard. Maybe some of you uh, would like me to pray with you, and that's okay. You, you can or you don't have to. It's up to you. I'm always here for you, and I'm over there 24-7-365. Don't tell my wife, right? <laughs> um, maybe, maybe you just want to sing to God because what you heard makes you so excited. Any of those things is okay. We're just going to worship, and the song we're going to sing is going to be perfect, all right? If you're able, stand with us like that.